gentlemen, or is it, uh, well, it's good afternoon, isn't it? Hello. Uh, my name's Ad Adam Reynolds, and uh, Tom very kindly asked me to present today to talk about um, really investing in shells. So it's sort of part of my career, part of something I've been doing for the last 10, 15 years. Um, and it's been very, very interesting. You know, some good ones, a few bad ones. Um, but what I'll try and do today is be sort of quite brief uh, and sort of explain pretty what's happened over the last sort of, sort of three or four years, how, how it's done, what some of the returns were. And then I think what we should do is probably open it up to a QA. and a So I'm happy to, to answer any questions. There may be some questions on some of the companies that I may not be able to answer because I may be an insider. So, um, but we'll, we'll come on to that towards the end of the presentation. So um, if we go to the first slide. Um, yeah, sorry, thank you. If we go to the first slide. Uh, by background, I'm a corporate financier, started off as a stockbroker, and then really sort of migrated over to the corporate finance side of, of broking. Um, but then thought that rather than being a broker, there was probably a better way to do it, which was actually to, to, for me to sort of set up my own business um, and then to invest directly into uh, turnaround situations. So over the last uh, four or five years, I've probably rescued um, 10 struggling sort of PLCs um, they've often been very, very close to, to bankruptcy. And I think that what happens, um, more so on AIM than anywhere else, is that you end up seeing these companies that come to the market and they all look wonderful, it's great, and they raise four or five million pounds, and then the dream is never fulfilled. You know, the, the, the directors often overspend, the project they've got falls apart or it doesn't work. Um, and eventually your nomad and your broker resign because they're not getting any fees or they can't work out how, how, how to get paid. And so these companies sort of really, with, you know, really wither on the vine. And that was an area that I thought would be very interesting a few years ago to try and pick up some of these shells, refinance them, um, and then reverse an exciting business into them. And the sector that I've really specialized in um, has been the sort of life science med tech area where I've always felt that there's huge growth. A lot of these businesses have to be financed early on, but if you can get the funding um, and then usually get the second round of funding, you will end up with something successful. So I always try and create also um, substantial sort of shareholder value. And what I don't want to do, I don't want to have it all for myself. So if I go and buy a stake in a, in a, in a, in a busted shell um, or I have to call an EGM, I also want the shareholders, the long-suffering shareholders, and I think AIM is full of long-suffering, often private client shareholders. And what I want to try and be is, is sort of as democratic as possible. So you'll, on every transaction I've done, you'll always see there's an open offer. So whatever price I'm going in at, I'll also have an open offer to existing shareholders so they are able to subscribe at exactly the same price as the price I am paying. They probably won't get as many shares as I've got because I bought the, the key stake, but at least they've got an opportunity to participate back again if we're trying to revive a business. So the three examples I'm going to talk about are, um, which are, are Promether, Optibiotics, and EKF Diagnostics. First two, really easy, they've, they've done very well. The, the third one, did remarkably well and then fell upon slightly more difficult times. And you'll see that that one had a, a profits warning last week. But I think we have to look at not only the successful ones, you've got to look at the, the ones where there, have been a, there has been a problem and what can you do to solve that problem. We're always going to get maybe one wrong or two wrong, but as long as you get more right than wrong, that's the most important thing. So with Promethe, um, there, there, a, a, there, a, there was a busted... AIM PLC called Viology. And Viology had effectively taken about 30 million pounds from shareholders over a 10 year period. And it had promised everything and it had delivered bugger all. Every time they raised money, they raised money at a lower level and it got worse and worse and worse. And in December 2013, I was approached to see if I would um, mount a rescue of Viology and I was appointed to the board. And when I got there, I suddenly found out it had no money. It had 40,000 pounds of cash left compared to the 30 million that it had raised. And they didn't even have enough money to pay the nomads at the time. So we had to do something and sort it out quite quickly. So there was some IP in the business, but I wasn't sure what the IP was. So 
at the time the company was capped at five million, it was obviously ridiculously overpriced. And I thought, what I'll do, well, let's be fair, and I'll value it at a million pounds. So valued at a million pounds, and I underwrote a million pounds placing in January 2014. And at the same period, we also had an open offer for shareholders because I wanted shareholders also to be able to, to, to be involved if they wanted to, and that was fully subscribed. A few months later, once it had settled down and, and, and you know, we'd, I'd closed down effectively really the American business, we weren't going to put any more money into that, I was looking for the right company to reverse into the shell biology. And I came across something that I thought was probably the most exciting opportunity I'd, I'd probably seen in 10 years. And it was a company called Prometha. And Prometha was uh, a private DNA screening business um, in the non-invasive prenatal testing industry, which is for effectively for Downs, for, for, for being able to spot Down, Down syndrome in pregnant ladies a lot earlier than if you had to go for amniocentesis. Non-invasive as well. I thought the business was tremendous. The business wasn't making any money. It needed additional working capital. So I made an offer to the shareholders of Prometha um, and effectively offered them 10 million pounds in paper, in biology paper. We raised a further seven and a half million pounds via a fully underwritten, via a fully underwritten placing. That placing was three times oversubscribed. The total deal value was 20 million. And today, 18 months on, Valuation is just over 40 million. The investment is twice up from where we did it in um, July of last year. At one stage during this year, it was three times above the original investment price, but it's, it's twice, very happy with it. I think it's a, a wonderful company, great management, and a product of various products that are next generation, but, but have got revenue, and that, that's the key. Revenue drivers are the key to a lot of these businesses. So that was Prometheus. So we'd saved a, a bankrupt company where every shareholder would have got zero. We put something in there that was very exciting, and we gave shareholders, the original shareholders, the opportunity to subscribe to more shares, and if they wanted to, they could have bought more shares in the marketplace. So I think that is a great template of what I've been trying to achieve for a long time. The next business um, we did, which is a similar, similar period actually, was Optibiotics. Now you all may have heard about or read about Optibiotics. It's been a tremendous success during, during this year. Um, and in November 2013, I came across, a, a, again, another bankrupt AIM business called Ceres Media. It was bankrupt. Liability is 300,000 pounds. The management didn't know what to do. They've got to find some money to pay off the creditors. They didn't know which way to turn. And I said, OK, I will come in, I'll take control, and I'll try and do a deal with the creditors. Did a deal with the creditors, gave the, gave the creditors 20p in the pound. We injected £400,000 of new cash, uh, and we also issued warrants to ourselves, and also we did an open offer to shareholders at the same time. It was done at the equivalent of 8p because we had a consolidation when we acquired Optibiotics. Um, we acquired Optibiotics in August 2014. We went out to raise um, two and a half million initially. We had five, five, six, seven million of subscription. We ended up taking three million. We took it at 8p. Current share price is 80p. Market cap 64 million. So shareholders, they've made 10 times their money um, on their original investment. But also those early shareholders and those shareholders who followed us from the very start pre-acquiring Optibiotics have actually made 20 times their money because they had one-for-one -one warrants in there as well. So, you know, tremendous return, huge opportunities still with Optibiotics. Um, and I'm just delighted that we, we, we started with something that had originally listed in 2007. And the shareholders needed, in their, their, their old format, the equivalent of about 45p to get their money back where they started. And that was, that was probably going to be unheard of. Today, they're back at 80p. People have got their money back from 2007, and they've actually doubled their money from 2007. If they'd actually come in on the placing as well, they probably would end up making about four times their original investment. So it's a very poor investment by the original investors in 2007. The advisors were not uh, terribly helpful at that time, but we've managed to sort it out, correct it, get people their money back, and also make money, make money for people. But often, there are companies that you do where they have great potential, and sometimes it doesn't always turn out that way. So EKF Diagnostics was really where it all started for me as far as doing shells. Um, 
I was appointed to the board of a company called IBL, which was an international brand licensing. It was a sportswear company. And it used to own the Admiral sports brand. We sponsored the, the England cricket team, and we owned the worldwide rights. The company had three million of debt. It was loss making. I became chairman and effectively sold one brand to cover the debt. And again, had to do deals with creditors as I went through. And over a period of two or three years, I sold the Admiral brand. I sold it in a piecemeal format to various licensees around the world and sold all the assets off for seven million, resulted in a net four million cash shell. And I always believe that management is a key to any business. And David Evans, who I have a huge amount of respect for and very high regard for in the life science sector, David approached me and said uh, he wanted to really recreate another diabetes diagnostics company. And I said, yeah, that's great. 2009, wanted to bring Julian Baines in as CEO. That was great. And effectively, in November 2009, share price was 8p. These guys joined the board. We raised some money, and shareholders had the opportunity to come and subscribe. Our strategy was to build a global diagnostics business, and we were doing a fabulous job. By January of last year, we had a market cap of 125 million. Share price was 40p. So we've done well for shareholders. Middle of 2014, things started to become a little bit more difficult. We bought a molecular business in America. And all of a sudden, the re and it, it, we thought it was going to be tremendous. And this is where you can get it wrong on occasions. We thought the reimbursement program was going to be very strong. And suddenly, the American government cut reimbursement. So where we bought a business and we paid $35 million, OK, it's $35 million in paper, but still people think it was still $35 million. We had to fund the business as well. We had a business that was not making money, hemorrhaging money. We thought we could still get it right, but we couldn't. So we've consequently, we've, we've had two profit warnings, and you've got to take it on the chin. You're not going to get everyone right, but the share price started to rebound a little bit on Thursday and Friday. OK, it's back to 11.5p. Um, the directors at the moment can't deal, but hopefully we'll be able to deal very, very shortly. Um, but that was, that's an, a, an example of we've got it right, but then something comes out of left field. But you've got, to, you've got to take it on the chin, and we've got to be very, very ruthless and hard. And we're making some very, well, it's been announced the decisions we're making in EKF, and we will now get it right. But sometimes it does go wrong, OK? So what, when we do something, what, 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 you know, what do we look for? And I think that the most important thing for any business, it's the management. You've got to have, you've got to have the right management in a company. You can have a great business, and you can have lousy management, and over a period of time, they'll bankrupt the business. You can have a great management in not such a good business, and often they'll find areas and they'll be able to find acquisitions. So the management, to me, management is key to really everything, everything, everything we do, okay? You're investing in them. You want to know their track record. And often you want to know, and one of the other acid tests really is that have they made money in the past? Loads of PLCs out there, the management live very high on the hog. They, they've got big salaries, they've got big credit cards, they've got big cars, they've got big offices. I hate that, I loathe that. I, I find it repulsive. What is key is that the management have got a big stake, they've got a track record, and they have made money in the past for all their shareholders, and they are committed. If they're not, I don't want to know, and if they're not, they're never going to work for me or be in any, any company I'm involved in. I like people who have got a big commitment, and it's all about share, share price growth, because if it is share price growth, it benefits all of us. So, Okay, so the structural points of doing a deal, okay? Product, market are often key. You've got to find the right business. You've got to find where the market is, and you've got to find something that you think the growth is going to be there. Keep the deal structure simple. Don't overcomplicate anything. Loads of, loads of these highly paid advisors want to overcomplicate, make things so difficult. You overcomplicate it, the investor doesn't understand. Just keep it as a very, very, very simple structure. You need to have the ability to raise money. Where I'm lucky, and the reason why I'm, I never want to be greedy, is that in the past, I've made money for all of the great majority of my investors I've always made money for. So what it means is the next deal you do, they will want to back you in the next deal. So as long as you have got quality investors and the ability to raise the money, 
you can often do most of the deals that are out there. And I often find that when we go out to do things, sometimes it's us who are raising the money. It's not the broking houses. It's the four or five institutions that I know very, very well because we've made money for them historically. Um, always have a team of, team of specialist professionals that you know that they've worked with you in the past. Sometimes you bring on other advisors or other lawyers. They don't know how you work. I think where I'm lucky is I've got a team of people. Some of them I think are here in the audience today. I've got a team of people who know how I work. I know how they work. And that often cuts down a lot of time and a lot of cost. And that's very, very, very important. Always price a deal to go. So many clowns overprice, okay, thinking that the valuation's up here, haven't we done well? Well, actually, the valuation might be up here today, but actually, when you, you know, a week after coming to market, the valuation is down there. And so you're not, a hero, you're not a hero, you're the enemy. Price it down there to start with. It doesn't matter. You've still got the same percentage of equity. You'll get it to there eventually. Price it to go, get it right, and, it, and, and you'll be then creating value, not only for yourself, but for, 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 the, new, for the new shareholders. So my conclusion, really, is that I look at so many opportunities a year. I will turn down, it says 99% here, I'll probably turn down 99.9% .9 because I just, they just don't make sense to me. You've got to know your limitations. You know, probably, yeah, I could do 10 deals a year and it would probably be very profitable, but there's no point because you'll do 10 deals a year, six might be good, four will be terrible, you've lost money here and here and here for people. I don't want to do that. Maximum I'll ever do is two deals a year. That's all I will, and probably it'll be, probably next year it'll be one deal, that's all, because it's all about quality, selection and quality. Stick to the sectors you know, build up your reputation and your skill set, and I think this is really key. You're only as good as your last transaction. You know, you, there's loads of people around who have done great deals, but actually they, people only remember their, 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 their last one. You know, and really the acid test is the share price. However well the share price has done, that is, that is the acid test to what you're doing. It's about creating value, creating value for your investors. Look after your investors. I think so many companies forget that as time goes on. Look after the people that have invested in you. Thank you. I think that's it. Right, any questions? Thank you. Yes. Yeah, uh, yeah I can talk a bit about it. I can't talk all about it, but I can talk all about it. Yeah, there's, okay, so with Promether, um, uh, you, pr back in March, um, we were very proud of an announcement that I think we had signed the Genoma contract in Switzerland and we were, we knew we'd got the St. George's, the first NHS hospital, uh, which Illumina were also after that and they also wanted Genoma. Uh, they suddenly came out of the blue on a Monday morning that they were suing us over, um, at the time, two, two, pat two patent infringements. Um, we've never infringed any of their patents. You will know from the sector that that sector is, has been full of litigation. Illumina have sued everybody within, within that sector, from Ariosa, you know, Roche, everybody. They sue everybody. And all they want is market share. Um, in America, in August, um, there's a US patent, which is patent 540, and it got thrown out by the Supreme Court. That was an Illumina patent 540. And the, and the judge said in the Supreme Court, you can't patent what is created by nature, okay? The 540 patent, is identical to the European 693 patent, which they're claiming against us. So what I hope, I think, I think it's a 693 patent, what I hope eventually happens is that the judge in the UK goes, actually, that was thrown out in America. That is exactly the same. We'll follow, we'll, we'll follow the, same, the same guideline. I think what really happened was that Illumina were trying to slow us down in the marketplace. We came to the market, we had the first CE mark product, Illumina didn't. Illumina wanted that space, they'd invested substantial money, they saw us as a tiny, tiny business but with great technology. They wanted the space, they wanted the NHS, they wanted the UK, they wanted Europe. With Illumina as well, um, their patents are only, are only European patents, so it doesn't stop us from being in China, it doesn't stop us being in Asia, it doesn't stop us being in South America, um, it doesn't stop us being in Europe anyhow, but, but we will fight and we are fighting those patent, that we're fighting those, um, that litigation very, 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 very strongly. Okay? Does that, is that, does that answer? Yeah, I would have thought probably, probably, I think if it, if it comes to court, and there's a big if there, I think it'll be October, October next year.
Uh, sorry, I'll, I'll be with you in one moment. Yes. What, the AIM shells? I think, what, I mean, what happens is you can probably look you know, at the back of the FT or you could look on Google or whatever or wherever you get your prices from and you'll see a million AIM companies out there. Um, okay, sometimes it's difficult but to spot them. But I think really at the end of the day, there's, there's a number of very, I've got, I've got some great relationships with a number of great corporate brokers in, in the city, some really good people. And sometimes when they have been looking after a PLC, and it's, and it's hit hard times, you know, they will contact me and say, we've got this or we've got this shell, um, you know, can we, you know, can, can we, can we have a chat? Would it, be something that, would it be something that you would like to do? Often I go, well, actually, you know, it's in a sector that I know nothing about. You know, what's the liability? You know, what are the debt accreditors? Let me look through that. Oh, you know, what are the contract? You know, what? Sometimes you say no to things whereby there's a lot of liabilities held by the PLC. What I like is things whereby some of the liabilities or leases, or because sometimes when you've got to cut something, you've got to cut everything. You just want the quote. But sometimes you might have a, 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 you know, a bad lease on a property in somewhere where the business is going to close down. I don't want that. And sometimes that might be held by the PLC. If it's held by the subsidiary, great. But where they come from is from the advisors, you know, from the nomads or brokers, sometimes from my accountants. Uh, who are corporate, you know, the auditors of some of my companies uh, know a lot what's going on, so they'll offer me things, friends, you know, so that, that, that's, really that's really how it happens for me. Is that okay? Yes. Never, never retain them. Um, I mean, because really what happens is that I'm really focused on the, on the quoted entity, on the shell. I'm not interested in the business that, that, that I'm buying, I'm buying this, I'm, you know, there's a PLC, they have an operating business. If it's in trouble and doing very badly, the, re, the reason is it's probably they're not a very good business or the management are pretty awful in the first place. The companies I acquire, yeah, 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 very much, yeah, I mean, exactly, I mean, I'm buying those, yeah, I mean, you, yeah, I'm buying those businesses because the management are really good. I'll always keep the management, because often I've spotted what I want to buy, and what I want to buy is always a private, it's a, it's a very well run private business that I want to acquire, or it's something in the technology space, and the only reason I want to acquire it is because I think it's really good. So, and if it's really good, the management has done a cracking job, and those are the guys that I want to keep on all the way through. With the shell, where they've got you know, the bozos that have run it and run it into the ground, I want them out you know, literally on day one and thank you very much indeed, but, let, let, but let's move forward. But no, what we're acquiring, you know, I can't run businesses. I'd probably be the world's worst CEO. I don't want to do it. I'd, I've got the structure, uh, I've got the, the, the slightly bigger picture, you know, that, that macro view. When it comes down to the micro and the technology and everything else of it, no, don't, I, that's, not, that's not my expertise, okay? Thank you. Anybody else, any other questions? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, yes. Um, so, it's a great. So, React um, came out of a company that I that I own. So it was a related party transaction. So there was a company on the stock market called AutoCleanse that I thought was brilliant and bought it four years ago and took it private. Sitting within AutoCleanse, AutoCleanse is the biggest car valeting company in the UK. Okay. Sitting in AutoCleanse was this little business called React, which was making, which was very profitable. And I always thought if we could separate React out of AutoCleanse and have it as a standalone business um, and put some new capital in to let it expand, we would have a very, very, very good, good business. So that's what we embarked upon. Um, the, the, effectively the beginning of this year, and we completed that transaction in end of July, beginning of August. Since then, I wanted to go and acquire other businesses for React. And the reason I like React so much is that I, I love doing businesses up in the, I love acquiring businesses in the north of England because you're paying like one pound a square foot for, 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 for office rent, you know, where you're paying 50 pound a square foot down here. You get, some, you get some great people who the salaries are half of London prices and everything else. So with React, I said, look, go and find acquisitions that will fit um, very 
synergistically within what we've got. So we've got this deep, deep cleaning business. And it's a serious business, you know, whereby we'll go and clean Euston Station or last year we did Euston Station, Christmas, Boxing Day, in and out with 50 people, done and everything else. But there might be occasions whereby there might be an environmental issue where now with health and safety you've got to check for air quality. There might be somewhere by, by what we do deep cleaning and we've got to, something's got to be removed and there's asbestosis there. So we, need to, so we have, would have to bring an asbestos environment, our, our environmental company for the air testing and then you bring an asbestosis company in to remove the asbestos. So I said, look, what we need to do really is to have a, when we get contracted by these big building firms or by Network Rail or Mighty or whoever, rather than us have a contract, and we've got this big contract, but we've got to pay out this for this company, that for that, we don't own them, subcontract all this in, we'll do it. We could really increase our margin dramatically if we owned some of those businesses. So I said, look, go and look for an, for an environmental air testing business and look for, if we can, maybe asbestosis or something else. Came back, we found an, envir an, an, an environmental business to acquire. Looked at it, it was bust. So, we, you know, discussion, how much are you going to pay for it? And they went, well, I don't know, 200,000 pounds? Okay, yeah, I mean, if it looks like that, fine, but it would fit. As we got further into it, I said, look, if, if, we, you know, if one leaves this for a little bit longer, um, I think that this company may go bankrupt, so you might have a chance. So. Um, that's what they did. They waited a little bit longer. Graham, who runs the business, Graham Rumery, unbelievable, and he acquired the assets uh, from, uh, of this company for not a lot of money. And the same thing really happened with this asbestos company that, that, that he acquired. It was that um, there's an asbestos business set up by two guys in the demolition industry. Um, they had massive amounts of asbestosis that they needed, um, they needed sort of... Uh, taking away. They set this business up, they put a managing director in. After a year, this managing director sort of ran off with the money. And it was like, bloody hell. Um, they tried to bring somebody else in, but these guys were big business people and they didn't have the time. So they said to us, um, we've got all these assets, but we don't want them, but we need, do you know anybody who can run an asbestosis business? Well, actually, through a couple of people we knew, we knew somebody who could run an asbestosis business. So this guy went, yeah, they've got all the, the, the right kit, it's brand new kit. Again, React went, they made an acquisition of this kit, which is about a tenth of the price you'd have to pay for it. And literally now, and the statement was made by React about two or three weeks ago, that you know, they've now got environmental air testing, they've got asbestosis. What they are doing, so I'm led to believe, is that, we need to, we, that they need to get the accreditations through as a company, which takes about eight to 10 weeks. So hopefully those accreditations come through in January or February. And then you've then got three different you've got the three three different divisions to you know to to react to then drive it to drive it forward. And I think that yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a great business. I think it's a really just it's just a it's just a nice proper you know good business. And I think what you'll probably see with it, you know, there'll probably be other there'll probably be other bolt-ons as you go through because you know there are other companies within that space that you pro the company probably could acquire over a period of time. But you know, I think that when you want, when you do these big contracts, you want to have your company that can do everything from A to Z rather than before. We were probably doing everything from about A to F and then we'd have to subcontract people in and pay them a lot of money. But if, we can, if it can be done all under one roof, um, I, think we've got, I think we've got a great business going forward. And I, think, I think also that whole support service sector is a, it's a, yeah, we're in it and we've got the accreditations for a lot of stuff. It just needs the accreditations now for asbestosis and for, for air testing. And one thing is for sure, um, I think health and safety within that industry, it'll carry on getting, you know, the health and safety issues will grow and grow and grow. You know, I think now for landlords, uh, if you rent a house, you've got to put, you know, rather than put a fire alarm in, you've got to put a, a what is it, some, t some other testing thing, you know, and you're going to, yeah, carbon monoxide, yeah, and you're going to see that more with, with, air, with air testing, you know, with, with air testing. I think also what you've got is that when a landlord rents out an office building, it must now be tested for air pollution, the environment and everything else. Again, that's probably where React sits on the corporate side, that it will get hopefully contracts for testing, you know, with, with landlords, big landlords, big property companies. So every time they, they want to change a tenant or whatever, you know, we can, you know, React can be in there. So I think it's great business. Uh, it's very different to what, we, what, what, I'm, what I do in life sciences. Uh, but React to me is a, is a very, very solid, very well-run business. The people running it, I think, are 
yeah, they did a, they've done a great job in auto cleanse. They'll do, they'll do, they'll do a great job in React. Yeah, I'm not, you know, I'm not that much involved in React, probably being the largest shareholder. But you know, I think that they have got a great opportunity, and I have, when auto cleanse owned it, I, you know, I spotted, as a board, we spotted those opportunities that it had to stand alone. It's now doing that, and it's, and it's a very good business. Anybody else? Any questions? Any questions? Anybody? Going. Yeah, one more, yeah. Go on. Oh, yeah, that's the next one. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh -huh. I don't know. I mean, great. Good question. Um, I only got appointed to the board a week last, a week last Wednesday, okay? Um, uh, I called a board meeting last Monday. Uh, I've, never met, I've never met any of the... I've never met the directors. I spoke to them on the telephone. Um, all they tell me is that the cash position is what I thought the cash position was. Because I was just a bit concerned that, you know, where is the cash and everything else. Uh, and all I've said is that just at the moment, uh, let's not go down any other oil projects. Let's not go down any projects at all. Let us just hold it for a moment. Let me try and find the, the deal, the project to go in there, which I, which I will do. Um, but, not, but let's not... Let's not rush it. There'll be, there'll be nothing in New World this year, okay? So it'll be next year. We'll find, I'll find something. We'll reverse it in. We'll use the cash in there. Um, it was a mess. It's now stable. And I know where all the receivables and the payables are, and I know where the bank account is, and now let's get it. Let's get it. Effectively, it's a clean cash. It, it is a clean cash shell. And the Belize project, yeah, you know what? They want to carry on with it. I don't want to carry on with it. We, and we, and we, on that basis, we won't carry on with it because these guys raised 29 million pounds over, over the last seven years from shareholders. They've gone through 27 million pounds and they're telling me they've got some other oil projects. I don't really want to know because their track record hasn't, hasn't, hasn't performed terribly well so far. So what we've got to do at some stage, and it'll, be, it'll be, take a bit of time, We've got to try and get. We've, we've got to try and find something that goes in there that is going to give some shareholder growth and value. At the moment, I don't know what that is. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? No. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for listening to me. I might have droned on for too long, but thank you.